Thank you very much. Good day to all of you. Dr. Gabriel Weiss, President of the Leonora Carrington Foundation, Patricia Romero, Councillor of the Foundation, distinguished presenters of the international panel, panel Leonora Carrington at 100 years, friends who are with us today. On behalf of the Ministry of Culture and its general Office of Libraries, I want to welcome you warmly to the Library of Mexico, where today we are gathering in order to celebrate the centennial of a dear presence, a very dear presence, an essential presence in the world of art. For the Library of Mexico, it's great pride to be space for this celebration and collective reflection of the transcendence and current value of Leonora Carrington, but also the first re-encounter with her figure and creation in this place and many other places. This is a re-encounter that is not definite, a re-encounter with her wisdom, with very ancient and modern roots, her philosophical depth and her lyrical intensity, her mystery and her luminous humor her link, her enchanted link to magic, her love for the animal world, her freedom of action and thought, her vital surrender to surrealism that she managed to represent with images, forms, and words, and she represented the symbolic structures and archetypes of our mind, the dreams that unfold us, and the secret uh, weapons of existence. With the dialogue that will take place on this forum this morning, this fixes the spirit appropriate to these commemorations, new glances, new appreciations, resonances with her work, and is destined to uh, trigger. To approach this renewed vision to show us the vitality of Nunora Carrington, we have with us specialists from Mexico and from overseas. We recognize the passion and commitment with her art that has drawn them here today. Thank you for having come. We want to recognize the devotion and the great work of the Leonora Carrington Foundation to organize this encounter and all the activities that start at the Library of Mexico today and throughout the next three months. We want to appreciate the work of Gabriel Valls and Patricia Romero and their generosity to share with the public of this library with thousands of children, young people, and adults have visited share with them the worlds of Leonora Carrington and the pathways that she opened up to imagination and sensibility. Uh, I want to welcome you again to the library and to its 100 centennial celebration of this artist. Thank you very much, everybody. <clears throat> So we will give the floor to Patti so that she can make an introduction of what this encounter will be about this morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us today. Today we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of a great artist, Leonora Carrington. The Leonora Carrington Foundation is deeply grateful to the Ministry of Culture and the Library of Mexico for the support to carry out this panel. We want to appreciate our 10 presenters who are Whitney, Roger, Laura, Tere, that are sitting here right now, Susan, Jonathan, Carla, Catriona, and Stefan. Stefan and Catriona. 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 Por supuesto. Uh, tu esposo, Gabriel. <laughs> because this event is, has been able, thanks to their generosity of having come to Mexico, two of them from the UK, one from France, and the rest from Mexico City, with all the traffic that this implies. Today, each presenter represents 10 years of the centennial, a candle for each. Each one represents a, a 10 year candle. Thank you to the Modern Art Museum and the Museum of the National Fine Art uh, Palace 
for being part of this anniversary. We want to appreciate the mass media for their interest in UNORA and our work as a foundation. To the public, we want to let them know that they are part of the celebration with members of the panel that, as I said, traveled between yesterday and the day before yesterday from very far away in order to share with us this celebration. There will be two uh, panels to celebrate um, Leonora. If the cake comes, we will all be able to celebrate. The Foundation devotes this panel to two people that we love intensely, Leonora Carrington and Rafael Toval y de Teresa. Today was their birthday, both of them, on April the 6th. Thank you very much. As follows, I will ask the members of the panel to make a brief introduction of themselves. First of all, we have Whitney Chadwick. I will read the titles in Spanish, Leonora Carrington and the 19th Hall. I'm sorry this is in English, not Spanish, but um, I have an art historian from California and um, someone who has known Leonora since the early 1980s. I've worked with her on a number of um, exhibitions, book projects, and other, and other things. And uh, the, pa the paper that I'm giving this morning here is not really, a, it's, not, it's not an art historical analysis in any way, but it's rather a kind of memory piece uh, about my times I spent with Leonora and a, a, a few brief adventures that we had at, at one point. And, um, and uh, I'm mentioning two paintings. I've, I'm not sure what's going to come up on the, on the images, if, if anything. There was some problem with the PowerPoint. But um, the, the paper is in three sections, and uh, we will go from there. Are we ready to begin? Yes. Is it up? Recently, while browsing through a Sotheby's sales catalog of Leonora Carrington's paintings, I came across a painting that was unfamiliar to me. A mysterious scene it appeared to take place in a, in a wooded landscape and included a grove of trees, a group of masked and cloaked figures, a winged white horse, and a large flock of birds. Dated 1958, the painting carried two titles. The first, Sueño en el Bosque, roughly translated as Dream in the Forest, is straightforward and descriptive. The second, the 19th hole, obscure, and seems to refer to the game of golf. The painting recalled other works by Leonora, a number of which, of which satirized the pursuits of wealthy landed gentry in whose company the artist had grown up. Yet here, in this case, the title remained provocative, given the fact that there is no 19th hole in golf, uh, the game was played in, in, nine, in nine or 18 holes. So there was a kind of mystery at the heart of looking at this painting. In the end, the painting evoked not only family history, but the many and varied ways in which Leonora's paintings brilliantly transformed the mundane into subtle but subversive alternatives. To the artist, the real, so-called, the so-called real, existed only as a convention. More important were the parallel worlds that expose the limits of that assumed reality and that are explored in the drawing and written text down below with its evocations of a terror that defied reason and reality, as well as in paintings from the house opposite, 1945, to took my way down like a messenger to the deep, 1977, and many others, all of which, many of which transformed domestic spaces 
into sites of wonder, enchantment, fear, and power. As Leonora and I worked on exhibitions, books, and catalogs of her work in the 1980s, 1990s, and on, I found myself more and more curious about those parallel psychic spaces that fueled her remarkable creativity and her profound humanity in so many ways. Leonora's own search in this direction seemed to lead to several conclusions which she outlined at one point. They include patriarchy has suppressed women, humans are out of sync with nature, powerful animal connections exist. Her journey was one without expectation of resolution or of a single answer. The thermal inversion that bathed the city in acrid, acrid smog for two days, lifted on Palm Sunday, 1991. Sunlight warmed the paving stones as Leonora and I crossed the Zocalo on our way to the cathedral. It was early, the city center almost deserted, the relentless cacophony of Mexico City traffic commuted. Ahead of us, the stone facade of the Metropolitan Cathedral shimmered in the sun's refractive rays. Death and destruction, Resurrection and everlasting life are cornerstones of belief systems everywhere, but nowhere have they ever seemed to me more powerfully interwoven than in Mexico. Leonora had arrived at my hotel a little before seven that morning. Over plates of papaya and, and huevos rancheros, we debated the possible existence of a female goddess. It was a subject of personal concern to Leonora, less to me. Still, the profundity and scope of Leonora's creative world fascinated me. Shaped by the Celtic beliefs of her Irish grandmother, by her reading of Robert Graves and her studies of Tibetan Buddhism and Jungian psychology, among other sources, she drew on powerful generative sources, both in the artist's studio and in the kitchen. My own academic background, shaped by revisionist approaches to art history, always seemed to me without magic. And without magic and far more mundane. Yet during years of meeting in New York, Chicago, and Mexico City, and our work together, we always managed to find new and shared She only nodded and said, look, you can't go dressed in trousers. It's disrespectful. And don't carry a purse, she added. Cover your hair with a scarf. Curiouser and curiouser, I thought, as I went upstairs to change clothes, feeling a bit like Alice on her way down the rabbit hole. Leonora was outside questioning taxi drivers about their mothers when I returned. It was a subject dear to her belief that men who loved their mothers were unlikely to harm women who took taxis. In the taxi, she proposed a visit to the cathedral and asked the driver if he knew the Sonora market. His response was to slam on the brakes and pull to the curb. Too dangerous, he said, and sped away as we flagged down another cab. In front of the cathedral, we passed rows of women sitting on rough blankets, their thick, glossy braids tied off with brightly colored bits of yarn, echoed in the patterns of woven straw crucifixes laced with purple threads that lay at their feet. The drooping heads and bent knees of the small Christs conveyed a weary resignation, not unlike that of their creators, many of whom had driven hours to reach the city. As I bent down to select a handful of mementos to carry back to San Francisco, Leonora dropped bits of change into outstretched hands. Inside the cathedral, the smell of incense mingled with the murmur of voices and the occasional ring of high heels on the stone floor. We circumvented the nave, and exited into bright sunshine. While I brought a collection of beautifully woven palm fronds, Leonora interviewed taxi drivers for the next stage of our journey. 
Settling into the taxi, she spoke at length about her visits to the Sonora Market with Remedio Sbarro and the marvelous things they found and incorporated into the stories, plays, performances, and culinary adventures on which they collaborated during their early years in Mexico. After a short drive, the taxi dropped us off outside a large, rusty warehouse outside, accessed through battered, sliding doors. Inside, the air was rich with powerful odors that emanated from crates and boxes filled with herbs, spices, and potions, most of which I could not identify. Loose, loosely organized into three sections, the market had absorbed everything from healing herbs to black markets. It is here, Leonard explained, that the shamans and the curanderos find their supplies. She went on to point out cures for ailments from the known to the unknown. As we wandered into the labyrinth that is the Sonora market, I explored displays of herbs, potions, rattlesnake, skin, rattlesnake skins, dried lizards, frogs, and others. While Leonora slipped in and out of small stalls and pointed me toward tins of coyote balm, cures rheumatism, she announced, and herbs offering miraculous cures for just about any condition known. As she slipped off to question medium, mediums and spiritualists, I wandered along the dim aisles. As we went deeper into the market, the displays expanded amid sights, sounds, and smells that overwhelmed the senses. Leonora reappeared and told me that she had spoken to a woman who knew of a powerful corandera at the market, but was afraid to take Leonora to her. Instead, her husband would escort us. Following the man's instructions, we advanced through a dim light. Stopping in front of a curtained alcove, our guide turned and spoke to Leonora. He has, he has brought us to one of the best known curanderas, Leonora said to me, as he pulled aside a curtain and made a sign to enter before he disappeared. Inside the space, Leonora and an assistant negotiated a price, while I stared at walls covered with a hock and weavings and wondered what lay on the other side. Eventually, the attendant, the attendant escorted me, but not Leonora, through a torn curtain and into an even smaller interior room. Pulling aside a second curtain, she urged me to enter. I stepped inside and saw a Buddha-like figure on a low stool. Her powerful body was draped in woven fabric from which talon-like ringed fingers emerged. Thick plates of braided hair fell almost to her waist and the irises of her eyes glowed like coals in an otherwise expressionless face. I stood paralyzed, remembering stories my uncles had once told of foxes that hypnotized cats by swaying in front of them. I grew more nervous as the seconds passed. Whatever the question was with which the day began, it was long forgotten. There was a sudden commotion behind me. The curtain parted and Leonora appeared. Don't do it, she whispered. Don't do it. This woman works with black magic. She will kill frogs on your body and use the blood. I stood transfixed. Run, Leonora. This. She is too black, and the force pulling at you is negative energy. Quick, she repeated, her fingers tight on my wrist. Come away. Still holding Leonora's hand, I turned and stumbled out of the booth after her. Once outside, Leonora did not stop walking until we were well away from the market. Tired, awed, and frightened by what we had experienced, she prescribed a glass of tequila, and we quickly made our way to the bar at the nearby Nacional Hotel. It was still morning, the bar was deserted. Sitting at a small table near the window, we drank our tequila, and Leonora filled in gaps in the story. It was a story that I would remember forever, forever since. Um, and also, it was later an important part of my writing about uh, a, a, an exhibition of Leonora's work at the Mexican Museum in San Francisco, where the emphasis was on her, um, her experiences in Chiapas, what she had done and what she had seen there, and the work that she had produced. And in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way, the experience, it was the experience in the Sonora market with Leonora that prepared me to actually write something about the Chiapas, about the Chiapas stay and the work that came out of it. Last section, Paris, 2014. 
doing research on André Breton in the Bibliothèque Jacques Doucet in Paris. I found a letter written by Leonora to Breton's wife, Jacqueline, in New York in the early 1940s. Leonora and her partner, Renato Leduc, now married, had recently arrived in Mexico. Aware of Leonora's deep interest in magic and the occult, Leduc had arranged visits to a series of widely scattered sites of magic and, and or practitioners known for their powerful and occult practices. Traveling by car, the couple experienced a remarkable range of practices and outcomes, which, Leonis, which Leonora detailed in her letter to Jacqueline. Reading her account, with its emphasis on subtle distinctions between healing and magic, I was moved by her clear and concise analyses of individual practitioners and spiritual quests. Above all, however, the letter re reiterated the importance of community and the richness and power of human consciousness. Final sentence. I thought again about our experience at the Sonora Market and about the remarkable woman, brilliant, creative, brilliant, creative, original, and forthright, who shared so much about life and living with so many. Thank you.